reading from the book of Amos. Alas, for those who are at ease in Zion, and for those who feel secure on Mount Samaria. Alas, for those who lie on beds of ivory and lounge on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp, and like David, improvise on instruments of music, who drink wine from bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, they shall now be the first to go into exile, and the revelry of the loungers shall pass away. Here ends the lesson. The psalm is Psalm 146, as we've been hit on that last reading. Yellow is your part. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in rulers, nor in any child of earth. For there is no help in them. When they breathe their last, they return to earth. And in that day their thoughts perish. Happy are they who have the help of have the God of Jacob for their help. Whose hope is in the Lord their God. Who made heaven and earth, the seas and all that is in them. Who keeps his promise forever. Who gives justice to those who are oppressed. And food to those who hunger. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord cares for the stranger. He sustains the orphan and widow, but frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, throughout all generations. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Penny, if you would read the letter to Timothy. Thank you. A reading from the first letter to Timothy. There is great gain in godliness. For we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from and pierced themselves with many pains. But as for you, man of God, shun all this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and for which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Jesus Christ, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep the commandments without spot or blemish until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the right time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. It is he alone who has immortality and dwells in unapproachable no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. Here ends the lesson. Would you please stand now for the gospel acclamation? Brady, would you lead us? And uh, we will follow. <coughs> Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Scriptures to us, 
Make our hearts burn while you speak to us. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Glory, Glory to you, you Lord, Lord Christ. Christ. Jesus said, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades where he was being tormented. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things, but now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he might warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Alleluia. 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 Please pray with me. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful. Kindle in us the fire of your love. And by that divine light, illuminate your holy word to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> the traditional words that get read following a gospel reading are the gospel of the Lord, which kind of hides what I just said, which was the good news of the Lord. And I don't think most people listening to that gospel reading would say, hey, thanks for the good news. Really appreciate that. Certainly making my tail wag today. Great. Great way to start a Sunday. I titled the sermon, Is Anyone Accountable for Anything Anymore? No. <laughs> All right. Here you go. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Spirit. Now let's go on to the Nicene Creed. Uh, well, that was great. I I'm glad you said that. Because, I mean, I, then you're seeing what I'm seeing, right? In, in life and what's going on. The, the thing is, I, I don't want to get into politics, but, but the thing is, to give examples, the most public one has to do with leaders leaders of countries, leaders of states, <clears throat> people in power to make big mistakes that wind up with large coverage. What does it matter to you if I tell you about a guy who's managing a FedEx office, you know, like, and he won't even, I mean, there are so many large examples. And, and one of the lines that has come up to me that I, I hear, and please be clear, uh, this phrase is used by Democrats and Republicans alike. So, so don't take offense if you're rooting for, if I think I'm talking about your home team. 
It's the home team and the visitors, whatever they are. They all fall back on this. Mistakes were made. Mistakes were made. <coughs> Not by, I made a mistake. Or the mistake that was made that they're not telling you is that they forgot to do something so they wouldn't get caught. That's really the mistake. Are they sorry? Yes, they're so sorry that they took that idiot into confidence and he put an email in and, yeah, that was a heck of a mistake. Well, what about what you were doing? Oh, uh, yeah, well, mistakes were made. Mistakes. And even at that, you know, and, and I'll tell you, I didn't know, I mean, all this learning stuff. There, there was a horrible account when we were allegedly pulling out of Afghanistan the other year, and there was a drone attack. They found a guy and nailed this guy, who they saw as, I don't know what they thought he was doing, running arms or that. And he was actually on like a goodwill mission with things that people needed in and out of his car as he drove around. And they droned this guy. They just nailed him and killed other people around. Well, the guy was not an enemy. He was helping people, completely innocent. And then there were people around, including children, who got killed. And they finally came out through enough pressure from the press that it was finally grudgingly admitted that, yes, it was a mistake. Okay. And you and I probably believe that. I, I don't think one of our guys purposely saw this guy with a crowd of civilians handing out goods they needed and said, let's kill that guy. I don't I believe it was a mistake. That's fair enough. But where's the accountability? Who made the decision? Maybe you should be demoted. Maybe the conditions under which these guys are making decisions say like, whoa, 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 they have too much on their plate to handle. This ensures a mistake happens. And I can't tell you how many times personally I get into trouble when someone makes a mistake and I want to know why it happened. Oh my goodness. Well, what do you mean? I don't know it's perfect. I just want to know how did it happen so we won't do that again. That's all. But the level of defensiveness in this society is, is shocking. You just I made a mistake. If you can get them to say they made a mistake, they'll say like, well, you know, when you do this or that, sometimes then this is what happens. And then I find myself saying, and is that what you're telling me you did? Are you following me? Am I getting you lost? When they're using a passive, inactive voice, well, why did that happen? Well, when you do this and that, then this thing happens here. Did you do this and that? Uh, yes. All right, get someone else for their job. I, I, does anyone know what I'm talking about? No, show of hands, I, I don't want, oh, uh, wow. <laughs> if you're looking on YouTube, almost everyone raised their hand. This is, Part of our society at this point. And why do I mention this? Look, whether the story is true or not, the father of our country, the indispensable man, George Washington, was known for cutting down the cherry tree when he was a kid and promptly admitting he did it. And, and that was drilled in iconically into the consciousness of America. And who was the other really, really great president? Abe Lincoln, whose nickname was Dishonest Abe, uh, no, Honest Abe. Was he a clever politician? Yes, all right, we don't go there. But what I'm talking about iconically in terms of what the culture demanded of you and honored was that. George Washington, we cut, I cannot tell a lie, I chopped it down. So where, what the heck has happened? That's nowhere to be found. Nowhere. And I will tell you, it's because this country has moved away from being Christian. Because in Christian communities, admitting that you've done something wrong is honored. It's welcomed. When a sinner repents, heaven rejoices. And the community 
should reflect that. Some guy who really screws up should, the first place he should go is to church on Sunday. And that's the last place anyone goes. If, if, if somebody gets caught in a motel room and it winds up on the 10 o'clock news on Saturday, I guarantee you this guy isn't headed to the nearest church the next Sunday. He's probably headed to the nearest bar. And you know what? They'll receive him. And they'll, they'll say, wait a second, aren't you the guy? It's like, oh, dude, hey, this is the guy they caught you, poor SOB. Let me buy you a drink. I was like, you know, he'll be a sinner and be welcome. Like, oh, yeah, man, how did, they set you up. How could they do that and whatever? Everybody be buying them drinks and telling them their stories and all of that. That doesn't happen in church. So maybe we're part of the problem. We have to be part of an environment that, that blesses people for being really honest about what they did wrong and that they'll feel loved for that and honored. That it's an honor that you owned up to that. I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's not like what you did was really, that's not good. But God bless you, man, you're owning it. Last week and this week, we're talking about wealth. Uh, this month. Last week we had the, the shrewd steward, he had access to money, and he used it to secure his place in his kingdom. And I said, are, are, are we as shrewd as that guy is in his world as we are in God's world and securing our place in the kingdom? This week we have a rich man, plenty of resources again, who lost his place in the kingdom. And so to some degree, they're meant to be looked a little bit back and forth, not entirely. How did they respond to being held accountable? You know, last week I told you one thing about this dishonest steward. Right? He does no pushback on what he did wrong. He's, he owns it. And he doesn't complain or this or that, whatever. That's not true with the rich guy. Uh, and we'll get into it. And by the way, in case you didn't know, I want to make sure you've got the, your, your takeaway for today for sure. Please note, all human beings will be held accountable by God for everything they've done in their lives. Just you want to put that as a bookmark somewhere in your daily reader. <laughs> don't, don't forget. Don't forget. And you can look at that, and if you're a Christian, say, Thank God I've got Jesus. I know that, and I will be accountable. And I have a feeling, an idea I should say, that when we go before the throne of, of God, which is Jesus Christ, he's going to nail us on things. We're just like, I don't even remember that. Oh, yes. And I don't know if he has a heavenly version of a videotape. He's like, want to see it? <laughs> and I was like, no, 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 sorry. No, if you said it, it's good. I'm sure I did it. Are you sure? Went, no, no, no. It's good. It's good. <laughs> or you can be the other type who say, well, I don't, I don't remember it. Well, I don't think, you know, if I don't remember it, why should I be accountable for it? You know, I did that in alcoholic blackout. Yeah, but you ran over two pedestrians. Yep, I was in the blackout when they did it. You can't. You're not going to put that on me, are you? And then Jesus says, yes. And then you say, well, I don't think that's fair. And you say, oh, do you know the rich man who was with Lazarus? Yeah. Well, you'll be making friends with him. You're going to be bunk buddies. So, you know, this is scary, but not scary. And, and part of what goes, and I'll tell you about this, but Getting in the habit in this world of being accountable prepares you for the big accountability up in the sky. About the rich man, what's the information we get? He's wearing purple. You know, th this, th this sounds like, pardon my French, literal French, nouveau riche. He just sounds like a guy who came into a lot of money, you know, and he's flashy. Everything's flashy. No one really wears purple every day. Even Queen Elizabeth didn't wear purple every day, you know. But this guy does. Because he can. And he's got the money. And purple is the single most expensive garment you can wear if it's colored purple. 
it comes from this very discreet process that they have to use all these resources to get that color. So it advertises your wealth. The fine linen, that's his underwear. And the fine linen, in, in certain Arab proverbs say, it's worth its weight in gold, literally. It's that fine, it's that marvelous, it's that fabulous. So he's wearing that, and, and that's like the narcissism. You don't even get to see it, but he knows he's wearing it. Great. And he feasts every day, every day, not the every day. Now what you wouldn't get from that, don't forget this guy is Jewish. Because when he's dead, he says, Father Abraham, and Abraham says, child, so he is a Jew. Jews never feast every day. The Sabbath? So what it's telling you is this Jew, he's Jewish, but he's not keeping the law. He's lawless. He feasts every day. And the other thing it's telling you is that he's making his servants work on the Sabbath because they have to work the feast every day. Are you getting the picture now? Who is this guy? That's him. Lazarus. Well, the name Lazarus comes from Eleazar, who actually was a steward or helper of Abraham. Very interesting figure. Uh, and he's poor. But he's the kind of poor that's poor, not out of laziness. But it's impossible for him to make a living. It's, it's not through, through his own laziness, lack of imagination, always messing up at work, keeps getting fired. That's not it. It's because of his condition makes him incapable of courage. And he's laid at the gate. It tells you something about the character of Lazarus, whoever this poor guy is. He's in sores, which probably makes him unclean. And yet he has friends who take him bodily and lay him at the gate. So he's got a good place to beg. Begging is part of this culture, as you probably know. And, and it, it's very lowly, it's not dishonorable. It's people just can't, through circumstances, make money. And so it's considered part, almsgiving is giving to people like him. That's not tithing, almsgiving. And so he's dependent on almsgivers. And he's laid at the gate and these sores and the dogs well, certainly they found through archaeology in Egypt thousands of years ago, they had hospitals where they had hospital dogs going around and licking people's wounds. And science has revealed, yes, in fact, there's something in the saliva of dogs that can help heal the wounds. I, I, I don't think it's covered by health net, but um, I'm going to go with the ancient wisdom. That's not what's being shown here. These are wild dogs. And wild dogs were decidedly unclean because wild dogs would go after our version of roadkill. And so they were eating off of corpses more often than not. And then that dog goes to lick Lazarus. Thank you very much. Happy Sunday morning. What you needed to hear today. But that's the condition of the man. The theme of the Gospels comes back time and again. Are you bearing fruit? Are you bearing fruit? What do you do with what you're given? We've got the rich man. In Scripture, being rich is seen as a blessing by God. Now, some people go further and think it shows God's favor toward them. Not everyone rich is under God's favor. You don't mix that up. Many are, but riches are as much a, a, a test to a person's character, if not more, than poverty, scripturally. What does God expect of a rich man? He expects him to share the blessings with people. You see this in, in the Gospels all the time. He says, you know, Jesus is talking to Pharisees. Fine, you're very generous with your family. What do you do for the stranger? Look, even the Pharisees, you know, feed their family well and take care of them and, and do favors for other people who then could do them a favor. Of course. Why don't you have someone to, to dinner who, who can't buy dinner? 
you're not going to get the invite and say, hey, next week, why don't you come over to our house? My wife is a great cook. She'd love to see. Oh, yeah, back and forth, back and forth. Oh, I'll pick up the tab next time. Oh, okay, and then we do that. No, these are people, they'll never pick up a tab because they can't. They can't make a meal. Thank you very much. And Jesus said, you should be inviting them. What's this guy doing? <laughs> He's so diametrically opposed in his whole lifestyle. It's all about me. That's it. Consequences. There are consequences. <laughs> they don't tell you this anymore. There are consequences. And part of what happens in a society like ours, they try to keep mitigating the consequences for bad behaviors. This is why you find sometimes someone it create, you know, commits a heinous crime. And, and you're reading about it. And you find out, He's been caught, convicted, and released five times. And now finally he does this. And you say, what the hell happened there? Pardon my French, but that's how we talk. <laughs> what went on there? It's like, well, um, it, it could have been rape charge, but that's kind of hard to prove. So we let him plead a lesser charge of assault. And, this, and so this ongoing thing of people never quite facing the consequences because they get to plead down. Because we've got a court, we're gonna move it through the court. We have so many people, we're gonna, let's get it going here. That's me, that's so. And so it's hard for me to preach consequences because never mind that, you're seeing in the news, in the world news or the local news and national news, everything that everyone's getting away with. They're not paying any consequences for it because they've got the power, they've got the pull. They've got the money. The guy's investigating, saying this should be a criminal offense. The one above was getting the money from the person. Says, I think we'll just put it down to misdemeanor. That's a felony. She did that. She should. I, yeah, but you know who she is. You know the amount of power she has. The connection she has. If I do that, I'll be crushed. But if I bring her down to a misdemeanor, Goodies will flow. That's America, by the way. Here's a guy who never expected consequences for his behavior, and you're getting an insight to his character. He's in hell. This reminds me of the guy in the Monty Python thing. It's just a flash wound. You know, inability, you know, the guy is sitting there, a torso and a head, minus his limbs, because they've been cut off by the other night. And he still wants to fight. He said, look at you, he said, oh, it's a mere flesh wound. Okay, here's Lazarus, here's the, the rich man. He's in hell, he's still like, hey, get that guy Lazarus to, wait a minute, can you get that guy Lazarus, get him to get some water, to... I'm not feeling well down here. Can you take care of that, Father Abraham? This is like so insane, it's just crazy. Like morally, spiritually, craziness, not realizing the condition you're in. And a lot of people don't realize the condition that they're in. They're walking around like they're not sinners, they're okay, everything's fine. It's like, you're as crazy as a rich man. You think, oh, I'm good to go. It's like, really? And the fact that he knows Lazarus by name is killer. It means, oh, you knew who this guy was on the outside. <laughs> So he's not saying, I had no idea. Well, who is this guy? No, no, oh, Lazarus. Oh, yeah, that poor guy who couldn't earn a living covered with sores. Uh, that guy, yeah, he was at the gate every day. I had to step over him, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, I know Lazarus. And being descended of Abraham doesn't save him. I was baptized when I was three months old, and I've been a member of this church for that, so I'm going to heaven. Talk to the rich man. The final ending is incontrovertible, and there's a chasm. It's done. It's over. There's no more. And the guy is saying, well, go to my brother, so listen to Moses if he comes back. And he's saying, no, they won't. If you don't listen to Moses already, you're not going to listen when he comes back. And there's also a hint at the resurrected Christ. You're not going to listen to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ can die and rise from the dead, and you still won't listen to him. There were people at the ascension 
who were still kind of stroking their beards and saying, um, I don't know, maybe. I'm not making this up, it's in the gospel. My experience, I kind of told you already. I gave you dessert first. I told you my experiences. It's not good. Uh, usually I find if I want to hold someone accountable, no matter how nice I do it, no matter how pleasantly, they, that's it. That'll be the end of the relationship. They're so emotionally immature, they're so whatever, just like, or it'll be simply, uh, I'm, I'm in another Monty Python routine, the dead parrot routine. You sold me a dead parrot. No, it's not. It's, it's, it's dead. It's like, it's dead. No, it's not. There, see, it moved. No, it's, it's a dead parrot. No, nope. you didn't do that. No. Nope. Well, there was something wrong with that. No, there isn't. I've gone to three other people and they say, no. Well, they don't. And I begin to think that people are crazy, flat out. They're mentally ill. And just like, you know, you can't, I, I don't know if you've had the misfortune of trying to talk to a drunk. <laughs> you, you wind up looking like an idiot all the time. You, you talk to someone who has a uh, personality disorder. Psychopath, sociopath, borderline personality, narcissist, antisocial. You're the one who wind up looking like an idiot. Because they're going to tell you why actually you're the one who's wrong. And how dare you? Because mm -hmm. it's like, oh. And you're just like, where are you going? That is my experience, I'm sorry to say. But we as Christians have Christ's commands of how to have relationship with one another. How to lovingly hold one another. To one another and to God Almighty. It's in Matthew. You can read it. It's very simple. So we have his example, and we have the example of the apostles. Paul corrects Peter. Peter doesn't cancel Paul. In fact, he speaks to him very well, even after having been publicly corrected by Paul, saying, You're wrong. Back off. Here's what you need to do. Stop being a coward. receives it. And we have the people of the Old Testament who are corrected and who receive it. Adam and Eve, they don't push back. They finally admit, although they're kind of blaming different things and different people, but ultimately they receive God's judgment and they don't go off saying, how dare he? They got it. And they know they got off easy. And they were shown mercy. These pictures you have of the angel angrily pointing them out, and the two of them naked crying when they go out, that is not the Bible. The angel was there to guard them lest they come back and, and eat of the tree of eternal life and remain sinful forever. And they'll never get out of that condition. And they're being sent out clothed by God in furs, which means that there was a, a substitutionary sacrifice of animals to quote unquote cover their sin, and they're in fur, clothing. God didn't send them out naked, how would he? But they can't be here anymore. But you have to go out there, and you're gonna have to have a hard life, but you're gonna have a life. And I wanna bless you that you can procreate. I'm inviting you into the, the great glory of creation. You can be part of it, it's like, because what they did was a capital offense and they should have been destroyed immediately for what they did. And they got off. So we have examples and that they take it, they receive it and move on. And the big example I told you the other week of David with Nathan. Nathan calls out David for what he did and there's no pushback. And he repents and he writes a psalm so everyone will know what he did wrong, how he suffered from not repenting, the blessings that came when he finally repented and how glorious God is. Psalm 51. So there's no excuse for us. <laughs> the pagans got plenty of excuses. We don't. Accountability. It takes two or more. It takes two or more.
You've got to have other people. You've got to have people that you allow, that you show up, that you give permission, that you seek accountability for. Seek accountability. Did I do something wrong there? And if it's something else in your life, you're not going to that person saying, I'm, I'm getting this happening. Do you think, do I do anything wrong? In AA, we're taught this from an early age in AA. No matter what the other person did, say, well, what was your part in it? Even if it's only 10%, I get that. Tell me about your 10%. What's your 10% that you did wrong? Well, it wasn't the first time this guy did that, but, but you made an appointment with him or you did business with him again. Well, yeah, because I thought now he's sober and it's like, we'll be different. It's like, yeah, but you know what his history was, yeah. And you went ahead. Well, that's your part in it. Does that take away what he did? Not at all. Uh, you need to move on and you need to forgive. And I'll tell you, one of these things, someone was coming to me and said, I guess, you know, after listening to me giving the talk in an AA meeting about step eight and talking about forgiveness, he said, I realized my partner stole a couple hundred thousand dollars out of the business. And he said, I'm in a court process now. And he said, I'm beginning to think what I need to do is stop that and forgive the guy. And I said, I am so sorry you misunderstood what I said. He said, well, what were you saying? I said, you do need to forgive your partner and then go ahead and sue him. <laughs> That's the way you do it. You're not angry, it's nothing personal. You're not getting back at him, but you do demand justice. And so that's how you do it. But yes, of course we need to forgive. And what God is showing us time and again, little things, big things. He's basically saying to you and me, look, if you can't even own up to the little mistakes you make here with one another, and be honest, and seek to do restitution, to make amends for what you did. Not simply say, okay, I know, so I made a mistake. Your mistake cost us $5,000, Chili. Oh, 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 what? It cost us $5,000. What do we do about that? All these people got killed in Kabul from the drone. Oh, it was a mistake, fine. What do we do about it? What are we gonna do for these people and their families? I heard nothing in the news accounts. So as a result, they've tracked down the families, they're doing this, and no, that was a mistake. That was a mistake. Only made a mistake. Oh, well, that's that. This is not gonna cut it with God. So that's a big message. You got the big accountability in the sky, and it's coming. And if you can't even handle these little things, whoa, I mean, honest to goodness, what chance do you think you or I are going to have <coughs> if we hold on to resentments and our own stuff and blame other people and all this stuff? Where's this going to go? So, start training. Get into shape. We're going to get into shape for the big accountability. If you don't know the steps, take a look at step 10. That's the ticket. Look at step 10. Look it up in the 12 steps. And if you don't know what it's about, you come to me, I'll explain to you, and start practicing that on a daily basis. Get ahead of the curve. Sometimes my wife and I, she works the steps as well. And this is true with other friends. Just gave a call and say, were you okay with what I said? Do you hear what I'm saying? Before maybe they call and say, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable with what you said or what you texted. Don't get ahead of them, say, were you okay? And nine times out of 10, they'll say, oh yeah, it was fine. Or once in a while they'll say, I, I did kind of wonder, you know, and so, and then you move on from there. And, and never offer excuses, but always be willing to offer an explanation. This, I think, is very helpful. And I use that language. I said, this is not an excuse, but I want to explain. I hadn't eaten, and I was driving on five cups of coffee, and you called me. And, and that's what you got. So I'm not excusing the behavior, but I do owe you an explanation. You get it? That's very helpful in making amends. So it's your move and my move. Do your steps, get that 10 step working in your life, and then you'll be ready when you meet Jesus in the next life. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you please stand and join with me as we say together the Apostles' Creed.